In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In 2005, one of my favorite writer-directors, Joss Whedon, put out his cinematic debut, a film called Serenity. If we could just all make an agreement right now not to acknowledge that 2005 is nearly two decades ago, I would be grateful. <laughs> the film takes place 500 years from now and is a continuation of the story Whedon told in the series Firefly. In the film and the series, the solar system is controlled by a group known as the Alliance, against whom, of course, there are rebels who fight, who are known as the Independents. And at first glass, it seems like your standard Empire Rebels narrative, just straight out of the Star Wars book. But as the film develops, following the Independents in their battle, the philosophy of the film deepens. And for me, when I watched this film back then, what blew my mind was the discovery that the evil alliance, what they had been doing, the core of their mission was to make the universe a more peaceful place. And to do that through the injection of a chemical into the atmosphere that could suppress aggression in people. I mean, this is why it's not too long after that that Star Wars, I think, cribbed from Serenity when Darth Vader becomes Darth Vader in the person of Anakin Skywalker and rises as Lord Darth and the Emperor says to him, let us go bring peace to the Empire. The story continues from there, I won't spoil it. Both the original show Firefly and the follow-up film Serenity are absolutely worth your time. But I remember watching that in early 2005, early in graduate school in realizing that I awkwardly enough understood where the Alliance was coming from. I mean, if there was something that you could do that would just pull all aggression and violence out of the universe, wouldn't you be tempted to do that? You see, it was watching that film that for the first time I truly understood, I think, the temptation behind fascism. Because even though that word has become this debated boogeyman of politics in our own time, at its core, what fascist ideology does is it seeks to use force to bring, bring about its conceptualization of the good. Power is put in service of the ideals of whatever group it is, with no checks, no concern for the individual, the good will be brought about through force, no matter the cost. That's just the definition of what fascism is. But of course, like I said, in Serenity, even though I understood where the alliance was coming from, what, what became clear in the film was that making people good through force, by removing their choice, that this inherently poisoned and broke the good they were trying to bring about. And this is, this is true throughout history. Whenever people in power seek to use that power, that force, to make the world after their own ideals, to force the world to be the way they think it should be, the result is often a heinous and evil opposite of the good they thought they were bringing about. For the Babylonian exiles from Judah in the 6th century, they longed for the world to be made right again, indeed through force. They longed for a forceful rescue and saving of their nation and people. For centuries, they had been under the thumb of empire after empire, remembered geographically with the Holy Land literally at the crossroads of Asia, Africa, and Europe. They had been trampled upon and used as pawns in another empire's game for centuries, and they longed for something more <laughs> as they languished into the 6th century in exile in Babylon. Others languished in exile along the banks of the Euphrates, and still some left in their homeland, the nation destroyed. And so when 2nd Isaiah begins, which always begins chapter 40 of Isaiah, with the words comfort, comfort ye my people. As the people heard those words of comfort, they would have had a sense that salvation is finally at hand, that God is finally coming in might to make the world the way it should be, 
to make their lives the way it should be. But as Isaiah continues, it's a very strange salvation that he describes. The struggle is clear. Near the end of chapter 40, after the message of comfort, the struggle of the people is articulated in verse 27, where the prophet asks, Why Israel cries out, saying, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. That Hebrew word translated as right in the New Revised Standard Version is actually this wonderful, rich Hebrew word, mishpat. It's usually translated as judgment or justice. It's a word that occurs throughout the Hebrew Bible and especially in the book of Isaiah. The people want to know why their justice is disregarded by their God. They want to know why God is not bringing about justice for God's people. And then that complaint is answered in chapter 2 in our first reading for today. The prophet tells the people that their salvation is at hand, that justice is coming. The prophet writes at the beginning of today's first reading, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice, mishpat, to the nations. Justice is coming through the servant described in Isaiah 42. But when you look at this servant, it's a rather strange picture of God's judgment. Isaiah writes of the servant, he will not cry out or lift up his voice or make it even heard in the street. As one commentator writes, given the severity of the situation, why not make a bold announcement? Uttered noisily in the streets to catch the eye of the passerby, why does the singer appear instead of the street preacher? Why is the poet assigned to bring the message in place of the herald? Indeed, instead of a powerful military or royal figure or even a fiery prophet that we might expect to come and bring God's justice, we're told that this servant is a bruised reed, a dimly burning wick, but that he will not break, he will not be quenched. We're told that it is through this servant that God's justice will finally be brought forth. When it comes to these servant songs in Isaiah, the one in Isaiah 42 is just the first of four of them. Contemporary scholars are often wrapped up in trying to identify who the servant was. Of course, Christians immediately see in this vision a picture of Christ. Hence the appointment of this text for today, the Feast of Christ's Baptism, when his ministry of bringing God's justice began. But scholars debate who this would have been in Isaiah's time. It could have been King Cyrus of Persia who eventually released the exiles and sent them home. And in a lot of ways, he was the salvation they longed for. But he doesn't fit the picture described in Isaiah 42 at all. Others imagine perhaps it was one of the leaders of the returning exiles of their nation who helped them rebuild the temple of their country. Or others suggest that the suffering servant is perhaps an image for Israel as a whole. Indeed, this is the approach of rabbinic Judaism. It, uh, rabbinic Judaism identifies the suffering servant not with the Messiah who would come, but with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, as they had been formed through unspeakable injustices and persecutions in Isaiah's time, continuing on into our own. But I've long appreciated a different approach that some scholars take. One taken, for example, by biblical scholar Paul Hansen, who finds in this passage not a reference to an historical figure or a community, but instead he writes, the servant is a catalyst for reflection on the nature of the response demanded of those who've received a call from God. And that means that the description of the servant in this text is meant to be a description of you, meant to be a description of me. The servant in this text should describe any person who's passed through the waters of baptism and who seeks to carry on the ministry of Christ in their own body, in their own life. And so the servant songs are, I think, actually, I think they're a warning, a warning to the church and to Christians. A warning that true faithfulness, true justice will never be won through force and violence. The most faithful Christian is very rarely the one who shouts the loudest and demands their way, whether that's in society or in the church itself. 
Rather, the most faithful Christian is usually much more like the servant in Isaiah 42, like Christ himself, patient, nonviolent, merciful, and yet still persistent in speaking God's truth, God's justice, God's mishpat, God's law to his time. The true servant of God is found rarely shouting in the street because the true servant of God knows that the goodness of this world will never be brought about by berating and castigating others, by demanding they live and speak the way you want them to. And every time Christianity thinks that's the place, we have failed to understand the ministry of the Christ we follow. I also want to say that I think it's true if you try to live this life of a servant of Christ, a servant of God, it's true. Some days you can feel like a bruised reed who can barely stand up straight, given what's going on in this world. Some days you may feel like a, a dimly burning wick, like your fire has almost gone out. The prophet Isaiah reminds us in this reading, in that beautiful word, phrase, the coastlands are waiting for God's teaching. Actually, in Hebrew, it's the coastlands wait for God's Torah, the Hebrew word for the law of God, which serves as the foundation of God's justice in society. The coastlands, the coastlands are waiting. The Jewish people in the 6th century thought God was going to come and make their nation powerful again. It would never really happen. Then Christ came and the people thought, oh, now's the time. Now's the time we're finally going to get our way. And that bruised reed was beaten. That dimly burning wick was almost extinguished by the hate of religion, the cowardice of politics. And in the early church, as we heard in the reading from Acts today, St. Peter finally realized that the coastlands that are waiting for God's teaching means that God's love, God's justice must extend beyond people like you. That if God is truly God, then God must show no partiality. But every person who seeks to be a part of love and justice might, must be welcomed in to this new thing God is bringing about. Oh, don't get me wrong, we backslide over and over again as followers of Jesus. But man, we've got to remember that there are still coastlands, there are still people out there waiting for justice, demanding it, just as fervently as the people in the time of Second Isaiah. And that's your job, I think. It's my job. It's all of our jobs. Baptized children of God. Whether you're going to be baptized this morning like Joshua in just a few moments, whether you were baptized decades ago, or whether you haven't been baptized yet and have maybe pondered it, or whether your baptism is so long ago you can't even remember it and you're not even sure you believe in it anymore, it doesn't matter, it's still your job. The frustration and anger you feel, that anger and injustice, that is good. It's good that you can see when God's mishpat, God's justice, is not real in the world. It's good. It means you can see the world is not the way God would like it to be. But be careful that in your anger and injustice, you don't fall victim to the very evil you reject. You don't buy into the false promise of using force and power to ensure others do what you think they should do. Because goodness can never be forced. Rather, goodness is only ever born. And it is born in those who find themselves buried in the waters of God's love and baptism. Goodness is born when society sees a bruised reed and dimly burning wick, not giving up. It's what happened in the 60s, when the followers of Dr. King stood up the fire hoses and dogs and didn't give up, bruised reeds, dimly burning wicks, the rest of society saw and thought, oh my God, what have we become? 
We've been so wrong. Not everyone, but a lot of people. That's how change comes. By being that person. The person of justice. But of a justice that is tender and merciful. And desires not victory over your enemy. But salvation and healing of all. That is how goodness is born in you. That is how you will help give birth to goodness in this world. By, su by surrounding it with the love of a God who will not and has not given up. Amen.